Section 1 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song, and Art. Volume 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan section one prayer in a mosque old cairo by jean leon jerome french painter born in eighteen twenty four died nineteen o four painting frontispiece the mosques of cairo are never closed and at any hour you may see men at prayer or reading the koran service in a mosque is thus described by pierre loti the french traveller and novelist above the silence a voice seemed to float a plaintive voice so profoundly melancholy chanting in a very high pitch like the muezzins that it seemed to die away of exhaustion then to revive once more and vibrate tremulously under the high domes lingering protracted as if slowly expiring dying at last only to begin afresh this voice was leading the prayers of this crowd of men at its bidding they first fell on their knees then prostrate in yet deeper humiliation and finally all at once as one man they struck the ground with their foreheads with a regular movement altogether as if thrown down by that sad sweet monotone passing over their heads dying away at moments to the merest murmur but nevertheless filling the vast body of the mosque now and again there was a flutter of wings the tame pigeons which are allowed to build their nests high up in the clerestory disturbed by the little lights and the soft rustle of so many robes took to flight and wheeled about fearlessly over the thousand white turbans and the devotion was so complete the faith so deep when every head was bowed to the incantation of that small feeble voice that one might have fancied they rose up like vapour from a censer in that silent and multitudinous orison notice the wonderful perspective of this picture the lines of worshippers stretch off interminably the length of the aisles has no limit the figures at the right are brilliantly arrayed in the most gorgeous of silks and velvets and their belts are stuffed out with weapons in charming contrast with these belligerent devotees are the pigeons that fly about the old moorish arches and cluster on the stone paved floor end of section one this recording is in the public domain section two of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by sonia egypt part one how things were done four thousand years ago historical note the rulers of egypt from the earliest times to the conquest of the country by alexander the great in three hundred thirty two b c are divided into thirty one dynasties or groups but the dates are so uncertain that it is a question whether the first dynasty reigned three thousand or five thousand seven hundred years before christ the first dynasty whenever it may have been was the time of menes and with this the real history of egypt begins it is said that he united the states of egypt and then set out to build a capital city for the location he chose the present site of memphis and in order to make it larger and to protect it from being overflowed by the nile he built a great dike which turned the course of the river to the east it is recorded that he gave his people laws and made war successfully that he reigned sixty-two years and was finally killed by a hippopotamus of his successor it is related that he built a palace and wrote medical books the two events of the second dynasty were that a severe earthquake opened a wide chasm at bubastis in which many perished and second that a law was made enabling women to hold the sovereign power of the third dynasty it is related that the libyans revolted from the egyptians but that the moon suddenly became larger than usual and that this phenomenon probably an eclipse so terrified the rebels that they returned to their allegiance 
this history or legend whatever it may be worth comes from the writings of one manetho an egyptian priest who lived in the third century before christ he had access to the ancient records kept in the temples and from these he compiled his history end of section two this recording is in the public domain section three of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section three strange stories of early egypt by herodotus the egyptians besides having a climate peculiar to themselves and a river differing in its nature from all other rivers have adopted customs and usages in almost every respect different from the rest of mankind amongst them the women attend markets and traffic but the men stay at home and weave other nations in weaving throw the wool upwards the egyptians downwards the men carry burdens on their heads the women on their shoulders no woman can serve the office for any god or goddess but men are employed for both offices sons are not compelled to support their parents unless they choose but daughters are compelled to do so whether they choose or not in other countries the priests of the gods wear long hair in egypt they have it shaved with other men it is customary in mourning for the nearest relations to have their heads shorn the egyptians on occasion of death let the hair grow both on the head and face though till then accustomed to shave others feed on wheat and barley but it is a very great disgrace for an egyptian to make food of them but they make bread from spelt which some call z they knead the dough with their feet but mix clay with their hands every man wears two garments the women but one other men fasten the rings and sheets of their sails outside but the egyptians inside the grecians write and cipher moving the hand from left to right but the egyptians from right to left and doing so they say they do it right ways and the greeks left ways they have two sorts of letters one of which is called sacred the other common they are of all men the most excessively attentive to the worship of the gods and observe the following ceremonies they drink from cups of brass which they scour every day nor is it custom practised by some and neglected by others but all do it they wear linen garments constantly fresh washed and they pay particular attention to this the priests wear linen only and shoes of bibulus they are not permitted to wear any other garments or other shoes they wash themselves in cold water twice every day and twice every night and in a word they use a number of ceremonies on the other hand they enjoy no slight advantages for they do not consume or expend any of their private property but sacred food is cooked for them and a great quantity of beef and geese is allowed each of them every day and wine from the grape is given them but they may not taste of fish beans the egyptians do not sow at all in their country neither do they eat those that happen to grow there nor taste them when dressed the priests indeed abhor the sight of that pulse accounting it impure the service of each god is performed not by one but by many priests of whom one is chief priest and when any one of them dies his son is put in his place the established mode of sacrifice is this having led the victim properly marked to the altar where they intend to sacrifice they kindle a fire then having poured wine upon the altar near the victim and having invoked the god they kill it and after they have killed it they cut off the head but they flay the body of the animal then having pronounced many imprecations upon the head they who have a market and grecian merchants amongst them carry it there and having so done they usually sell it but they who have no grecians amongst them throw it into the river and they pronounce the following imprecations on the head if any evil is about to befall either those that now sacrifice or egypt in general 
may it be averted on this head with respect then to the heads of beasts that are sacrificed and to the making libations of wine all the egyptians observe the same customs in all sacrifices alike and from this custom no egyptian will taste of the head of any animal egypt though bordering on libya does not abound in wild beasts but all that they have are accounted sacred as well those that are domesticated as those that are not the following is the nature of the crocodile during the four coldest months it eats nothing and though it has four feet it is amphibious it lays its eggs on land and there hatches them it spends the greater part of the day on the dry ground but the whole night in the river for the water is then warmer than the air and dew of all living things with which we are acquainted this from the least beginning grows to be the largest for it lays eggs little larger than those of a goose and the young is at first in proportion to the egg but when grown up it reaches to the length of seventeen cubits and even more footnote about twenty nine feet End of footnote. it has the eyes of a pig large teeth and projecting tusks in proportion to the body it is the only animal that has no tongue it does not move the lower jaw but it is the only animal that brings down its upper jaw to the under one it has strong claws and a skin covered with scales that cannot be broken on the back it is blind in the water but very quick-sighted on land and because it lives for the most part in the water its mouth is filled with leeches all other birds and beasts avoid him but he is at peace with the troculus because he receives benefit from that bird for when the crocodile gets out of the water on land and then opens its jaws which it does most commonly towards the west the troculus enters its mouth and swallows the leeches the crocodile is so well pleased with this service that it never hurts the troculus with some of the egyptians crocodiles are sacred with others not but they treat them as enemies those who dwell about thebes and lake moiri consider them to be very sacred and they each of them train up a crocodile which is thought to be quite tame and they put crystal and gold earrings into their ears and bracelets on their forepaws and they give them appointed and sacred food and treat them as well as possible while alive and when dead they embalm them and bury them in sacred vaults but the people who dwell about the city of elephantine eat them not considering them sacred End of section three. This recording is in the public domain. Section four of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section four early egyptian picture writing by amelia b edwards here for instance is the ideograph for pet the sky it represents a ceiling or rather a crossbeam supporting a ceiling this looks like a metaphor but it is nothing of the kind the egyptians conceived the sky to be a ceiling or overhead platform of iron along which flowed the waters of the heavenly ocean daily from east to west this heavenly ocean was traversed by ra the sun god in his golden bark but at night the iron ceiling was lighted by lamps each star in the firmament being a lamp watched over by an attendant god we add a star suspended by a string the loose end of the string hangs down at the other side of the beam and this sign the sign pet with the star added is the determinative hieroglyph signifying night darkness gloom and all such notions these suspended lamps were the fixed stars and the gods of the fixed stars were stationary but the planets were lamps carried on the heads of wandering gods who sailed the heavens as earthly mariners sail the seas steering their barks by the divine chart and following fixed courses according to the seasons in the meanwhile the iron ceiling which formed the bed of the great upper ocean was supported at the four corners by the four sons of horus 
the gods of the four cardinal points they upheld it by means of four props shaped thus forked boughs in fact such as were used to support the roof of the primitive house when it rained the rain was taken to be an overflow from the superincumbent ocean and if it rained heavily which is very unusual in every part of egypt except the delta then every one was terrified lest the props should be giving way and the ceiling and the ocean should both be coming down together here we have the hieroglyph for rain consisting of the ceiling and the four props the props should of course stand at the four corners of the heavenly platform but the egyptians were hopelessly ignorant of perspective so they placed them in a row these props it will be observed support nothing because the ceiling is in the act of descending in order to convey the notion of rain to express a heavy storm shena the ceiling is shown as half way down we ourselves are wont to say when it rains very heavily that the sky is coming down the egyptians believed that it was literally doing so now they had also a word for clear light crystalline shining and the like the word tahen they spelled this word alphabetically but they required as usual a determinative of the sense and for that purpose they had recourse to another hieroglyph which represents the iron ceiling safely supported on its four props this represents the clear sky of egypt when all is bright overhead it remains to be told how there came to be an overhead ocean at the dawn of creation those waters covered the face of the earth so that there were no living things except such as peopled the sea then came the god shu and he separated the waters from the earth and uplifted them by main strength as a great god can and behold the gods of the cardinal points stepped in with their four props and fixed it up forever thus we see how a whole chapter in the history of human thought may be preserved like a fly in amber in two or three little hieroglyphs here we have the egyptian cosmogony the egyptian theory of the fixed stars and the planetary system and their explanation of the familiar phenomenon of rain we will now turn to ta the hieroglyph for land this sign is not of such far-reaching meaning as the last but it is a very interesting sign and i believe that it has not been analyzed till now here we see the level plain the surface of the earth the lower signs indicate what is below the surface the object shaped as an acute angle is a cutting instrument a wedge it indicates mining the three small balls stand for metals the vertical line means a sunk shaft the boring perhaps for an artesian well so here we have the earth and its riches metals and water and the little implement which symbolizes the enterprise and industry of man this is the ideograph for a city used also as a determinative sign after the name of any special city this object is described in hieroglyphic dictionaries as a cake and it certainly does resemble a kind of hot cross bun frequently represented in pictures of offerings but the sign pronounced nu is really intended for a walled town with its two main streets crossing at right angles at benha the site of the ancient city of athribis the lines of these two main streets are yet clearly distinguishable as doubtless they are in other places end of section four this recording is in the public domain section five of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by sonia the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section five how the egyptians painted portraits by amelia b edwards the earliest egyptian paintings to which it is possible to assign a date are executed in tempera upon the walls of certain tombs made for the noble personages who were contemporary with king khufu better known as cheops the builder of the great pyramid in these paintings we see herdsmen driving herds of goats oxen and asses vintagers working the wine press scenes of ploughing feasting dancing boating and so forth 
there is no attempt at scenery or background the heads are given in profile but the eyes are given as if seen frontwise the head being in profile one would expect to see the body in profile but this was not in accordance with ancient egyptian notions the artist desired to make as much of his sitter as possible to give him full credit for the breadth of his chest and the width of his shoulders and to show that he had the customary allowance of arms and legs so he represented the body in front view but he thus landed himself in a grave difficulty to draw a pair of legs and feet in front view is by no means easy it requires the knowledge of foreshortening and the egyptian artist was as ignorant of foreshortening as perspective he however met this difficulty by boldly returning to the point from which he first started and drawing the legs and feet in profile like the face nor was this all having no idea of perspective he placed every part of his subject on the same plane that is to say a man walking or standing has the one foot planted so exactly in front of the other that a line drawn from the middle toe of the front foot would precisely intersect the soles of both i have sometimes wondered whether it ever occurred to an ancient egyptian artist to try to place himself in the attitude in which he elected to represent his fellow creatures namely with his body at a right angle to his legs and his profile he would have found it extremely uncomfortable not to say impossible yet in this preposterous fashion he depicted princes and peasants priests and kings and even armies on the march strange to say the effect is neither so ugly nor so ridiculous as it sounds the outline is drawn with such freedom and the forms taken separately are so graceful that despite our better judgment we accept the conventional deformity and even forget that it is deformity when the ancient egyptian artist had drawn the face and figure of his sitter he proceeded to fill up the outline with colour if it were the portrait of a man he covered the face body arms and legs with a flat wash of dark reddish brown if it were the portrait of a woman he substituted a yellowish buff not that the men were in reality red brown or the women yellow but because these were the conventional tints employed to distinguish the complexions of the two sexes he next indicated the eyebrow by a black line of uniform thickness and for the eye he painted a black disc on a white ground the garments and the border patterns of the garments the necklaces the bracelets the rich belts the elaborate head-dresses were all treated with exquisite minuteness and in the same flat tint such being his system of colour it was of course impossible for our egyptian to represent light and shadow or the texture of stuffs or the flow of drapery his art in fact cannot be described as painting in our sense of the term he did not paint he illuminated inasmuch therefore as he excelled in the methods of illumination he was a singularly skilful craftsman but inasmuch as he has never been surpassed for purity and precision and sweep of outline or for the fidelity with which he produced the racial characteristics of foreign nations or for the truth and spirit with which he depicted all varieties of animal life he was undoubtedly and unquestionably an artist drawing only in profile and painting only in flat washes he could not and did not attempt to show the changing expression of the human face in joy or grief or anger the widow wailing over the mummy of her husband the pharaoh slaying his thousands on the field of battle looks out into space with the smiling serenity of a cherub on a tombstone but let rameses return to thebes after a victorious campaign in ethiopia or asia minor bringing a string of foreign captives bound to his chariot wheels and see then what our egyptian artist can do with nothing but his reed pen and his whole coloured washes he produces a series of portraits of syrians libyans negroes and asiatic greeks which no english or french or american artist could surpass for living and speaking individuality and which probably none of them could do half so well if compelled to employ the same methods End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain.
Section six of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Conquests of Ramesses the Second, an Egyptian wall painting, page ten. The Egyptians were exceedingly fond of wall paintings, and with them they adorned not only walls but columns, mouldings, and ceilings. They used a wide variety of colors, many of them of the most brilliant tone in some of their paintings there was an attempt to imitate the colours of nature but in the representation of people they observed certain conventions for instance a man's face was always painted dark red and a woman's light yellow shading was almost unknown and figures were drawn in profile important characters were often indicated by their size in one of the reproductions here given the king's war chariot and horses are two or three times as large as those of the warrior who follows him however in proportion or out of it the paintings give a remarkable impression of activity no one has sat for a picture every one has been snapped while walking or running or shooting these illustrations were drawn to immortalize the mighty victories of rameses the second who lived some thirteen centuries before christ in one of the pictures he is pressing forward in advance of his troops and with weapon in hand is hewing his way through a multitude of his foes in another his mighty steed is dashing into the midst of the fleeing enemies notice the curious fashion in which these latter are arranged apparently up the side of a perpendicular wall to indicate numbers in the third picture the victorious sovereign sits on his throne graciously deigning to receive the tributes which the conquered peoples are humbly presenting to him the mummy of rameses the second was discovered in eighteen eighty one end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of egypt africa and arabia this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 7. The King's Palace and His Attendance by G. Maspero. The royal residence could be immediately distinguished by the projecting balconies on its facade from which as from a tribune pharaoh could watch the evolutions of his guard the stately approach of foreign envoys egyptian nobles seeking audience or such officials as he desired to reward for their services they advanced from the far end of the court stopped before the balcony and after prostrating themselves stood up bowed their heads wrung and twisted their hands now quickly now slowly in a rhythmical manner and rendered worship to their master chanting his praises before receiving the necklaces and jewels of gold which he presented to them by his chamberlains or which he himself deigned to fling to them it is difficult for us to catch a glimpse of the detail of the internal arrangements we find however mention made of large halls resembling the hall of atuma in the heavens whither the king repaired to deal with state affairs in council to dispense justice and sometimes also to preside at state banquets long rows of tall columns carved out of rare woods and painted with bright colours supported the roofs of these chambers which were entered by doors inlaid with gold and silver and encrusted with malachite or lapis lazuli the private apartments the aconuity were entirely separate but they communicated with the queen's dwelling and with the harem of the wives of inferior rank the royal children occupied a quarter to themselves under the care of their tutors they had their own houses and a train of servants proportionate to their rank age and the fortune of their mother's family 
the nobles who had appointments at court and the royal domestics lived in the palace itself but the offices of the different functionaries the storehouses for their provisions the dwellings of their employees formed distinct quarters outside the palace grouped around narrow courts and communicating with each other by a labyrinth of lanes or covered passages the entire building was constructed of wood or bricks less frequently of roughly dressed stone badly built and wanting in solidity the ancient pharaohs were no more inclined than the sultans of later days to occupy palaces in which their predecessors had lived and died each king desired to possess a habitation after his own heart one which would not be haunted by the memory or perchance the double of another sovereign these royal mansions hastily erected hastily filled with occupants were vacated and fell into ruin with no less rapidity they grew old with their master or even more rapidly than he and his disappearance almost always entailed their ruin in the neighbourhood of memphis many of these palaces might be seen which their short-lived masters had built for eternity an eternity which did not last longer than the lives of their builders nothing could present a greater variety than the population of these ephemeral cities in the climax of their splendour we have first the people who immediately surrounded the pharaoh the retainers of the palace and of the harem whose highly complex degrees of rank are revealed to us on the monuments his person was as it were minutely subdivided into departments each requiring its attendants and their appointed chiefs his toilet alone gave employment to a score of different trades there were royal barbers who had the privilege of shaving his head and chin hairdressers who made curled and put on his black or blue wigs and adjusted the diadem to them there were manicurists who pared and polished his nails perfumers who prepared the scented oils and pomades for the anointing of his body the coal for blackening his eyelids the rouge for spreading on his lips and cheeks his wardrobe required a whole troop of shoemakers belt-makers and tailors some of whom had the care of stuffs in the piece others presided over the body linen while others took charge of his garments comprising long or short transparent or thick petticoats fitting tightly to the hips or cut with ample fullness draped mantles and flowing pelisses side by side with these officials the laundresses plied their trade which was an important one among a people devoted to white and in whose estimation want of cleanliness in dress entailed religious impurity like the fallaheen of the present time they took their linen daily to wash in the river they rinsed starched smoothed and pleated it without intermission to supply the incessant demands of pharaoh and his family the task of those set over the jewels was no easy one when we consider the enormous variety of necklaces bracelets rings earrings and sceptres of rich workmanship which ceremonial costume required for particular times and occasions the guardianship of the crowns almost approached to the dignity of the priesthood for was not the uraeus which ornamented each one a living goddess the queen required numerous waiting women and the same ample number of attendants were to be encountered in the establishments of the other ladies of the harem troops of musicians singers dancers and almas whiled away the tedious hours supplemented by buffoons and dwarfs the great egyptian lords evinced a curious liking for these unfortunate beings and amused themselves by getting together the ugliest and most deformed creatures they are often represented on the tombs beside their masters in company with his pet dog or a gazelle or with a monkey which they sometimes hold in leash or sometimes are engaged in teasing sometimes the pharaoh bestowed his friendship on his dwarfs and confided to them occupations in his 
household one of them kanumhatpu died superintendent of the royal linen the staff of servants required for supplying the table exceeded all the others in number it could scarcely be otherwise if we consider that the master had to provide food not only for his regular servants but for all those of his employees and subjects whose business brought them to the royal residence even those poor wretches who came to complain to him of some more or less imaginary grievance were fed at his expense while awaiting his judicial verdict head cooks butlers pantlers butchers pastry cooks fishmongers game or fruit dealers if we enumerated them all we should never come to an end the bakers who baked the ordinary bread were not to be confounded with those who manufactured biscuits the makers of pancakes and doughnuts took precedence of the cake bakers and those who concocted delicate fruit preserves ranked higher than the common dryer of dates if one had held a post in the royal household however low the occupation it was something to be proud of all one's life and after death to boast of in one's epitaph the chiefs to whom this army of servants rendered obedience at times rose from the ranks on some occasion their master had noticed them in the crowd and had transferred them some by a single promotion others by slow degrees to the highest offices of the state many among them however belonged to old families and held positions in the palace which their fathers and grandfathers had occupied before them some were members of their provincial nobility distant descendants of former royal princes and princesses more or less nearly related to the reigning sovereign they had been sought out to be the companions of his education and of his pastimes while he was still living an obscure life in the house of the children he had grown up with them and had kept them about his person as his sole friends and counsellors he lavished titles and offices upon them by the dozens according to the confidence he felt in their capacity or to the amount of faithfulness with which he credited them a few of the most favoured were called masters of the secret of the royal house they knew all the innermost recesses of the palace all the passwords needed in going from one part of it to another the place where the royal treasures were kept and the modes of access to it several of them were masters of the secret of all the royal words and had authority over the high courtiers of the palace which gave them the power of banishing whom they pleased from the person of the sovereign upon others devolved the task of arranging his amusements they rejoiced the heart of his majesty by pleasant songs while the chiefs of the sailors and soldiers kept watch over his safety to these active services were attached honorary privileges which were highly esteemed such as the right to retain their sandals in the palace while the general crowd of courtiers could only enter unshod that of kissing the knees and not the feet of the good god and that of wearing the panther's skin among those who enjoyed these distinctions were the physicians of the king chaplains and men of the roll cri habi the latter did not confine themselves to the task of guiding pharaoh through the intricacies of ritual nor to that of prompting him with the necessary formulae needed to make the sacrifice efficacious they were styled masters of the secrets of heaven those who see what is in the firmament on the earth and in hades those who know all the charms of the soothsayers prophets or magicians the laws relating to the government of the seasons and the stars presented no mysteries to them neither were they ignorant of the months days or hours propitious to the undertakings of everyday life or the starting out on an expedition nor of those times during which any action was dangerous they drew their inspirations from the books of magic written by thought which taught them the art of interpreting dreams or of curing the sick or of invoking and obliging the gods to assist them and of arresting or hastening the progress of the sun on the celestial ocean some are mentioned as being able to divide the waters at their will and to cause them to return to their natural place merely by means of a short formula an image of a man 
or animal made by them out of enchanted wax was imbued with life at their command and became an irresistible instrument of their wrath popular stories reveal them to us at work is it true said cheops to one of them that thou canst replace a head which has been cut off on his admitting that he could do so pharaoh immediately desired to test his power bring me a prisoner from prison and let him be slain the magician at this proposal exclaimed nay nay not a man sire my master do not command that this sin should be committed a fine animal will suffice a goose was brought its head was cut off and the goose was placed on the right side and the head of the goose on the left side of the hall he recited what he recited from his book of magic the goose began to hop about the head moved similarly and when one was united to the other the goose began to cackle a pelican was produced and underwent the same process his majesty then caused a bull to be brought forward and its head was smitten to the ground the magician recited what he recited from his book of magic the bull at once arose and he replaced on it what had fallen to the earth the great lords themselves deigned to become initiated into the occult sciences and were invested with these formidable powers a prince who practised magic would enjoy amongst us nowadays but small esteem in egypt sorcery was not considered incompatible with royalty and the magicians of pharaoh often took pharaoh himself as their pupil such were the king's household the people about his person and those attached to the service of his family End of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eight how the egyptians amused themselves by sir j gardner wilkinson the most usual games within doors were odd and even mora and draughts for the first of which called by the romans ludere par et impar they used bones nuts beans almonds or shells and any indefinite number was held between the two hands the game of mora was common in ancient as well as modern italy and was played by two persons who each simultaneously threw out the fingers of one hand while one party guessed the sum of both they were said in latin micari digitus and this game still so common among the lower orders of italians existed in egypt about four thousand years ago in the reigns of the osirtasans the same or even a greater antiquity may be claimed for the game of draughts or as it has been erroneously called chess as in the two former the players sat on the ground or on chairs and the pieces or men being ranged in line at either end of the tables moved on a checkered board as in our own chess and draughts the pieces were all of the same size and form though they varied on different boards some being small others large with round summits some were surmounted with human heads and many were of a lighter and neater shape like small nine-pins probably the most fashionable kind since they were used in the palace of king ramses these last seem to have been about one inch and a half high standing on a circular base of half an inch in diameter but some are only one inch and a quarter in height and little more than half an inch at the lower end others have been found of ivory one inch and six eighths high and one and an eighth in diameter with a small knob at the top exactly like those represented at beni hassan and the tombs near the pyramids they were about equal in size upon the same board 
one set black the other white or red or one with round the other with flat heads standing on opposite sides and each player raising it with the finger and thumb advanced his piece towards those of his opponent but though we are unable to say if this was done in a direct or diagonal line there is reason to believe they could not take backwards as in the polish game of draughts the men being mixed together on the board it was an amusement common in the houses of the lower classes as in the mansions of the rich and king rameses is himself portrayed on the walls of his palace at thebes engaged in the game of draughts with the ladies of his household the modern egyptians have a game of draughts very similar in the appearance of the men to that of their ancestors which they call dama and play much in the same manner as our own analogous to the game of odd and even was one in which two of the players held a number of shells or dice in their closed hands over a third person who knelt between them with his face towards the ground and who was obliged to guess the combined number ere he could be released from this position another game consisted in endeavouring to snatch from each other a small hoop by means of hooked rods probably of metal and the success of a player seems to have depended on extricating his own from an adversary's rod and then snatching up the hoop before he had time to stop it there were also two games of which the boards with the men are in the possession of dr abbott one is eleven inches long by three and a half and has ten spaces or squares in three rows the other twelve squares at the upper end or four squares in three rows and a long line of eight squares below forming an approach to the upper part like the arrangement of german tactics the men in the drawer of the board are of two shapes one set ten the other nine in number other games are represented in the paintings but not in a manner to render them intelligible and many which were doubtless common in egypt are omitted both in the tombs and in the writings of ancient authors the dice discovered at thebes and other places may not be of a pharaonic period but from the simplicity of their form we may suppose them similar to those of the earliest age in which two the conventional number of six sides had probably always been adopted they were marked with small circles representing units generally with a dot in the centre and were of bone or ivory varying slightly in size plutarch shows that dice were a very early invention in egypt and acknowledged to be so by the egyptians themselves since they were introduced into one of their oldest mythological fables mercury being represented playing at dice with the moon previous to the birth of osiris and winning from her the five days of the epoch which were added to complete the three hundred and sixty-five days of the year it is probable that several games of chance were known to the egyptians besides dice and mora and as with the romans that many a doubtful mind sought relief in the promise of success by having recourse to fortuitous combinations of various kinds and the custom of drawing or casting lots was common at least as early as the period of the hebrew exodus the games and amusements of children were such as tended to promote health by the exercise of the body and to divert the mind by laughable entertainments throwing and catching the ball running leaping and similar feats were encouraged as soon as their age enabled them to indulge in them and a young child was amused with painted dolls whose hands and legs moving on pins were made to assume various positions by means of strings some of these were of rude form without legs or with an imperfect representation of a single arm on one side some had numerous beads in imitation of hair hanging from the doubtful place of the head others exhibited a nearer approach to the form of a man and some made with considerable attention to proportion were small models of the human figure 
they were coloured according to fancy and the most shapeless had usually the most gaudy appearance being intended to catch the eye of an infant sometimes a man was figured washing or kneading dough who was made to work by pulling a string and a typhonian monster or a crocodile amused a child by its grimaces or the motion of its opening mouth in the toy of the crocodile we have sufficient evidence that the notion of this animal not moving its lower jaw and being the only creature which brings the upper one down to the lower is erroneous like other animals it moves the lower jaw only but when seizing its prey it throws up its head which gives an appearance of motion in the upper jaw and has led to the mistake the game of ball was of course generally played out of doors it was not confined to children nor to one sex though the mere amusement of throwing and catching it appears to have been considered more particularly adapted to women they had different modes of playing sometimes a person unsuccessful in catching the ball was obliged to suffer another to ride on her back who continued to enjoy this post until she also missed it the ball being thrown by an opposite player mounted in the same manner and placed at a certain distance according to the space previously agreed upon and from the beast of burden office of the person who had failed the same name was probably applied to her as to those in the greek game who were called ovoi asses and were obliged to submit to the commands of the victor sometimes they caught three or more balls in succession the hands occasionally crossed over the breast they also threw it up to a height and caught it like the greek oboavia our sky ball and the game described by homer to have been played by hollius and laodamus in the presence of alcinous was known to them in which one party threw the ball as high as he could and the other leaping up caught it on its fall before his feet again touched the ground when mounted on the backs of the losing party the egyptian women sat sidewise their dress consisted merely of a short petticoat without a body the loose upper robe being laid aside on these occasions it was bound at the waist with a girdle supported by a strap over the shoulder and was nearly the same as the undress garb of mourners worn during the funeral lamentation on the death of a friend the balls were made of leather or skin sewed with string crosswise in the same manner as our own and stuffed with bran or husks of corn and those which have been found at thebes are about three inches in diameter others were made of string or of the stalks of rushes plaited together so as to form a circular mass and covered like the former with leather they appear also to have had a smaller kind of ball probably of the same materials and covered like many of our own with slips of leather of a rhomboidal shape sewed together longitudinally and meeting in a common point at both ends each alternate slip being of a different colour but these have been only met with in pottery in one of their performances of strength and dexterity two men stood together side by side and placing one arm forward and the other behind them held the hands of two women who reclined backwards in opposite directions with their whole weight pressed against each other's feet and in this position were whirled round the hands of the men who held them being occasionally crossed in order more effectually to guarantee the steadiness of the centre on which they turned sometimes two men seated back to back on the ground at a given signal tried who should rise first from that position without touching the ground with the hand and in this too there was probably the trial who should first make good his seat upon the ground from a standing position another game consisted in throwing a knife or pointed weapon into a block of wood in which each player was required to strike his adversaries or more probably to fix his own in the centre or at the circumference of a ring painted on the wood and his success depended on being able to ring his weapon most frequently or approach most closely to the line conjuring appears also to have been known to them at least thimble rig or the game of cups under which a ball was put while the opposite party guessed under which of four it was concealed 
the egyptian grandees frequently admitted dwarfs and deformed persons into their household originally perhaps from a humane motive or from some superstitious regard for men who bore the external character of one of their principal gods Pathosokari osiris the misshapen deity of memphis but whatever may have given rise to the custom it is a singular fact that already as early as the age of osirtasen or about four thousand years ago the same fancy of attaching these persons to their suite existed among the egyptians as at rome and even in modern europe till a late period the games of the lower orders and of those who sought to invigorate the body by active exercises consisted of feats of agility and strength wrestling was a favourite amusement and the paintings of beni hassan present all the varied attitudes and modes of attack and defence of which it is susceptible and in order to enable the spectator more readily to perceive the position of the limbs of each combatant the artist has availed himself of a dark and light colour and even ventured to introduce alternately a black and red figure it is probable that like the greeks they anointed the body with oil when preparing for these exercises and they were entirely naked with the exception of a girdle apparently of leathern thongs the two combatants generally approached each other holding their arms in an inclined position before the body and each endeavoured to seize his adversary in the manner best suited to his mode of attack it was allowable to take hold of any part of the body the head the neck or legs and the struggle was frequently continued on the ground after one or both had fallen a mode of wrestling common also to the greeks they also fought with the single stick the hand being apparently protected by a basket or guard projecting over the knuckles and on the left arm they wore a straight piece of wood bound on with straps serving as a shield to ward off their adversary's blow they do not however appear to have used the cestus nor to have known the art of boxing though in one group of beni hassan the combatants appear to strike each other nor is there an instance in any of these contests of the greek sign of acknowledging defeat which was by holding up a finger in token of submission and it was probably done by the egyptians with a word it is also doubtful if throwing the discus or quoit was an egyptian game but there appears to be one instance of it in a king's tomb of the nineteenth dynasty one of their feats of strength or dexterity was lifting weights and bags full of sand were raised with one hand from the ground and carried with a straight arm over the head and held in that position mock fights were also an amusement particularly among those of the military class who were trained to the fatigues of war by these manly recreations one party attacked a temporary fort and brought up the battering ram under cover of the testudo another defended the walls and endeavoured to repel the enemy others in two parties of equal numbers engaged in single stick or the more usual nabut a pole wielded with both hands and the pugnacious spirit of the people is frequently alluded to in the scenes portrayed by their artists the use of the nabut seems to have been as common among the ancient as among the modern egyptians and the quarrels of villages were often decided or increased as at present by this efficient weapon crews of boats are also represented attacking each other with the earnestness of real strife some are desperately wounded and being felled by their more skilful opponents are thrown headlong into the water and the truth of herodotus's assertion that the heads of the egyptians were harder than those of other people seems fully justified by the scenes described by their own draughtsmen it is fortunate that their successors have inherited this peculiarity in order to bear the violence of the turks and their own combats many singular encounters with sticks are mentioned by ancient authors among these may be noticed one at primus the city of mars described by herodotus when the votaries of the deity presented themselves at the gates of the temple their entrance was obstructed by an opposing party 
and all being armed with sticks they commenced a rude combat which ended not merely in the infliction of a few severe wounds but even as the historian affirms in the death of many persons on either side bull-fights were also among their sports which were sometimes exhibited in the dromos or avenue leading to the temples as at memphis before the temple of vulcan and prizes were awarded to the owner of the victorious combatant great care was taken in training the bulls for this purpose strabo says as much as is usually bestowed on horses and herdsmen were not loath to allow or encourage an occasional fight for the love of the exciting and popular amusement they did not however condemn culprits or captives taken in war to fight with wild beasts for the amusement of an unfeeling assembly nor did they compel gladiators to kill each other and gratify a depraved taste by exhibitions revolting to humanity their great delight was in amusements of a lively character as music dancing buffoonery and feats of agility and those who excelled in gymnastic exercises were rewarded with prizes of various kinds end of section eight this recording is in the public domain section nine of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org an egyptian experiment by herodotus the egyptians before the reign of Sa-Mid-ishu, considered themselves to be the most ancient of mankind but after Sa-Mid-ishu, having come to the throne endeavoured to ascertain who were the most ancient from that time they considered the phrygians to have been before them and themselves before all others now when Sumatishu was unable by inquiry to discover any solution of this question who were the most ancient of men he devised the following expedient he gave two newborn children of poor parents to a shepherd to be brought up among his flocks in the following manner he gave strict orders that no one should utter a word in their presence that they should lie in a solitary room by themselves and that he should bring goats to them at certain times and that when he had satisfied them with milk he should attend to his other employments Sumatishu contrived and ordered this for the purpose of hearing what word the children would first articulate after they had given over their insignificant mewlings and such accordingly was the result for when the shepherd had pursued this plan for the space of two years one day as he opened the door and went in both the children falling upon him and holding out their hands cried bacos the shepherd when he first heard it said nothing but when this same word was constantly repeated to him whenever he went and tended the children he at length acquainted his master and by his command brought the children into his presence when Sumatishu heard the same he inquired what people call anything by the name of bacos and on inquiry he discovered that the phrygians call bread by that name thus the egyptians convinced by the above experiment allowed that the phrygians were more ancient than themselves this relation i had from the priests of vulcan at memphis but the greeks tell many other foolish things end of section nine this recording is in the public domain section ten of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org egypt part two stories and poems of ancient egypt historical note most of the egyptian literature that has come down to us is more or less confused but what it tells is always interesting of the religious writings the book of the dead is of the first importance it consists chiefly of prayers and magical formulae and of the answers which the soul ought to be able to make to the god osiris after death in order to escape punishment 
for instance it is said that the soul must be able to declare i have not blasphemed i have not stolen i have not slain any one treacherously i have not been cruel to any one i have not caused disturbance i have not been idle i have not been drunken i have not issued unjust orders i have not been indiscreetly curious i have not multiplied words in speaking the stories of the egyptians are very interesting and sometimes have quite a modern or perhaps rather a universal touch in spite of the gravity of the good folk of egypt when cut in stone they were really a cheerful light-hearted people in one of their collections of stories king cheops is unable to sleep and calls upon his sons to amuse him by telling tales this is quite in accordance with the egyptian love of entertainment the stories are often well planned and have a definite beginning middle and end though unfortunately the manuscript frequently breaks off and the reader is left to imagine the ending for himself end of section ten this recording is in the public domain section eleven of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eleven from the oldest book in the world by tahotep put into meter by hardwick d ronsley the oldest book in the world is the precepts of tahotep the papyrus that we have was written about twenty five hundred b c but this is a copy of one written about thirty three sixty six b c by an egyptian prince called tahotep the real date of the precept goes even farther back than this for tahotep declares that they were the proverbs and sayings that had long been familiar to the egyptian people the editor one on avoiding the disagreeable friend if anything displease and though acting in his right any one should tease get away from out his sight when he ceases to address thee think not how he did distress thee and forget his spite two on humility and high estate if after being little thou art great and riches after poverty hast gained when thou art come unto the ruler state know how to use the rank thou hast attained let not thine heart be hardened by high place think these good things god doth to thee but lend put not thy one-time neighbour from thy face be still to him an equal and a friend three on dealing with temper if a man in a passion you meet and you know he is really your master give way nor get into a heat hands off and so save a disaster he will stick to his version my friend interruption is idle and wrong keep cool you will win in the end contradicted just govern your tongue if you deal with a disputant hot be like one who refuses to stir when he rails and abuses rail not and so you will vanquish him sir for the bystanders hearing the din say the man who provoked shows no fight is the best of the two you will win in the minds of the great you are right four on the secrets of success in work never disturb a man on business bent nor with distraction weaken his intent his task not you he to his arms would take who turns his sleeves up for his labor's sake love for the work in hand is passport given to wing the souls of humankind to heaven but be composed in trouble smile on fate let peace be yours when others agitate 
for they who labor with unruffled calm these men succeed they carry off the palm end of section 11 this recording is in the public domain Section 12 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 12. The Lost Malachite. From the Ancient Egyptian, edited by W. M. Flinders Petrie. The royal son, Bofra, then stood forth, and spake. He said, I will tell thy majesty of a wonder which came to pass in the days of thy father, Senefru the Blessed, of the deeds of the chief reciter, Zazamank. One day King Senefru, being weary, went throughout his palace seeking for a pleasure to lighten his heart, but he found none and he said haste and bring before me the chief reciter and scribe of the rolls zazamank and they straightway brought him and the king said i have sought in my palace for some delight but i have found none then said zazamank to him let thy majesty go upon the lake of the palace and let there be made ready a boat with all the fair maidens of the harem of thy palace and the heart of thy majesty shall be refreshed with the sight in seeing their rowing up and down the water, and seeing the goodly pools of the birds upon the lake, and beholding its sweet fields and grassy shores, thus will thy heart be lightened, and I also will go with thee. Bring me twenty oars of ebony inlaid with gold, with blades of light wood inlaid with electrum, and bring me twenty maidens, fair in their limbs, their bosoms, and their hair, all virgins, and bring me twenty nets, and give these nets unto the maidens for their garments. And they did according to all the commands of his majesty. And they rode down the stream, and up the stream, and the heart of his majesty was glad with the sight of their rowing. But one of them at the steering struck her hair, and her jewel of new malachite fell into the water. And she ceased her song, and rowed not, and her companion ceased, and rowed not. And his majesty said, Row you not farther? And they replied, Our little steerer here stays, and rows not. His majesty then said to her, Wherefore rowest thou not? She replied, It is for my jewel of new malachite which has fallen into the water. And he said to her, Row on, for behold, I will replace it. And she answered, But I want my own peace back in its setting. And his majesty said, Haste, bring me the chief reciter Zazamank. And they brought him. And his majesty said, Zazamank, my brother, I have done as thou sayest, and the heart of his majesty is refreshed with the sight of their rowing. But now a jewel of new malachite of one of the little ones is fallen into the water, and she ceases and rows not, and she has spoilt the rowing of her side. And I said to her, Wherefore rowest thou not? And she answered to me, It is for my jewel of new malachite, which has fallen into the water. I replied to her, Row on, for behold, I will replace it. And she answered to me, But I want my own peace back again in its setting. Then the chief reciter, Zazamank, spake his magic speech, and he placed one part of the waters of the lake upon the other, and discovered the jewel lying upon a shard. And he took it up, and gave it unto its mistress. And the water which was twelve cubits deep in the middle, footnote, about twenty feet six inches in footnote, reached now to twenty-four cubits after he turned it. And he spake, and used his magic speech. And he brought again the water of the lake to its place. And his majesty spent a joyful day with the whole of the royal house. Then rewarded he the chief resider Zazamank with all good things. Behold, this is a wonder that came to pass in the days of thy father, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Senefru, of the deeds of the chief reciter, the scribe of the rolls, Zazamank. Then said the majesty of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Khufu the Blessed, 
let there be presented an offering of a thousand cakes, one hundred draughts of beer, an ox, and two jars of incense, to the chief reciter, the scribe of the rolls, Zaza Monk, for I have seen the tokens of his learning. And they did all things as his majesty commanded. End of section 12. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 13 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Keith Hunter. Procession of the Royal Bull, Opus Osiris, by Frederick Arthur Bridgman, American Painter, 1847. Painting, page 40. Opus, the sacred bull of the Egyptians, was the one of their gods to whom most general veneration was shown. According to tradition, he must be black, with certain white marks of exactly the right shape and in exactly the right places, and under his tongue there must be a peculiar sort of knot. When an Opus bull died, the search for another to take his place sometimes had to be continued for years. When once found, the bull was treated with the greatest reverence and his birthday was elaborately celebrated. In this homage, the Egyptians worshipped not a mere bull, but rather what they regarded as an incarnation of the god Osiris, the god of the sun, who was to them the promise of immortality. The two names were sometimes combined, and the bull was called Opus Osiris or Serapis. This painting represents a procession in honor of one of these favored creatures. He is decked with flowers and gorgeous trappings. Incense is borne before him. His path is strewn with palms. Singers, dancers, and players on musical instruments accompany his march. Whether the sacred bull takes all this as his rightful due, or whether he is a little bored by it all, who can say? End of section 13. This recording is in the public domain. Section 14 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 14. The Shipwrecked Sailor. From the Ancient Egyptian, edited by W. M. Flinders Petrie. The wise servant said, Let thy heart be satisfied, O my lord, for that we have come back to the country. After we have been long on board and rowed much, the prow has at last touched land. All the people rejoice and embrace us one after another. Moreover, we have come back in good health, and not a man is lacking, although we have been to the ends of Wawat, and gone through the land of Sinmut. We have returned in peace in our land. Behold, we have come back to it. Hear me, my lord. I have no other refuge. Wash thee, and turn the water over thy fingers. Then go, and tell the tale to the majesty. His lord replied, Thy heart continues still its wandering words, but although the mouth of a man may save him, his words may also cover his face with confusion. Wilt thou do then as thy heart moves thee? This that thou wilt say, tell quietly. The sailor then answered, Now I shall tell that which has happened to me, to my very self. I was going to the mines of Pharaoh, and I went down on the sea in a ship of one hundred and fifty cubits long. Footnote. The cubit of the ancient Egyptians was equal to twenty point sixty four inches. In footnote. And forty cubits wide, with one hundred and fifty sailors of the best of Egypt who had seen heaven and earth, and whose hearts were stronger than lions. They had said that the wind would not be contrary, or that there would be none. But as we approached the land, the wind arose and threw up waves eight cubits high. As for me, I seized a piece of wood, but those who were in the vessel perished without one remaining. A wave threw me on an island. After that I had been three days alone, without a companion beside my own heart. I laid me in a thicket, and the shadow covered me. Then stretched I my limbs to try and find something for my mouth. I found there figs and grain, melons of all kinds, fishes and birds. Nothing was lacking. And I satisfied myself and left on the ground that which was over, of what my arms had been filled with all. I dug a pit, I lighted a fire, and I made a burnt offering unto the gods. 
Suddenly I heard a noise as of thunder, which I thought to be that of a wave of the sea. The trees shook, and the earth was moved. I uncovered my face, and I saw that a serpent drew near. He was thirty cubits long, and his beard greater than two cubits. His body was as overlaid with gold, and his color as that of true lazuli. He coiled himself before me. Then he opened his mouth, while that I lay on my face before him. And he said to me, What has brought thee? What has brought thee, little one? What has brought thee? If thou sayest not speedily what has brought thee to this isle, I will make thee know thyself as a flame thou shalt vanish. If thou tellest me not something I have not heard, or which I knew not before thee. Then he took me in his mouth, and carried me to his resting place, and laid me down without any hurt. I was whole and sound, and nothing was gone from me. Then he opened his mouth against me, while that I lay on my face before him. And he said, What has brought thee? What has brought thee, little one? What has brought thee to this isle which is in the sea, and of which the shores are in the midst of the waves? Then I replied to him, and holding my arms low before him, I said to him, I was embarked for the mines by the order of the Majesty. In a ship one hundred and fifty cubits was its length, and the width of it forty cubits. It had one hundred and fifty sailors of the best of Egypt, who had seen heaven and earth, and the hearts of whom were stronger than lions. They said that the wind would not be contrary, or that there would be none. Each of them exceeded his companion in the prudence of his heart, and the strength of his arm, and I was not beneath any of them. A storm came upon us while we were on the sea. Hardly could we reach to the shore when the wind waxed yet greater, and the waves rose even eight cubits. As for me, I seized a piece of wood, while those who were in the boat perished without one being left with me for three days. Behold me now before thee, for I was brought to this isle by a wave of the sea. Then he said to me, Fear not, fear not, little one, and make not thy face sad. If thou hast come to me, it is God who has let thee live. For it is he who has brought thee to this isle of the blessed, where nothing is lacking, and which is filled with all good things. See now thou shalt pass one month after another, until thou shalt be four months in this isle. Then a ship shall come from thy land with sailors, and thou shalt leave with them and go to thy country, and thou shalt die in thy town. Converse is pleasing and he who tastes of it passes over his misery. I will therefore tell thee of that which is in this isle. I am here with my brethren and my children around me. We are seventy-five serpents, children and kindred, without naming a young girl who was brought unto me by chance, and on whom the fire of heaven fell and burnt her to ashes. As for thee, if thou art strong, and if thy heart waits patiently, Thou shalt press thy infants to thy bosom, and embrace thy wife. Thou shalt return to thy house, which is full of all good things. Thou shalt see thy land, where thou shalt dwell in the midst of thy kindred. Then I bowed in my obeisance, and I touched the ground before him. Behold now that which I have told thee before. I shall tell of thy presence unto Pharaoh. I shall make him to know of thy greatness and I will bring to thee of the sacred oils and perfumes, and of the incense of the temples with which all gods are honoured. I shall tell moreover of that which I do now see, thanks to him, and there shall be rendered to thee praises before the fullness of all the land. I shall slay asses for thee in sacrifice, I shall pluck for thee the birds, and I shall bring for thee ships full of all kinds of the treasures of Egypt, as is comely to do unto a god a friend of men in a far country of which men know not. Then he smiled at my speech, because of that which was in his heart, for he said to me, Thou art not rich in perfumes, for all that thou hast is but common incense. As for me, I am prince of the land of Punt, and I have perfumes. Only the oil which thou sayest thou wouldst bring is not common in this isle. But when thou shalt depart from this place, thou shalt never more see this isle it shall be changed into waves. And behold, when the ship drew near, according to all that he had told me before, I got up into an high tree to strive to see those who were within it. Then I came and told to him this matter, 
but it was already known unto him before. Then he said to me, Farewell, farewell, go to thy house, little one, see again thy children, and let thy name be good in thy town. These are my wishes for thee. Then I bowed myself before him, and held my arms low before him, and he, he gave me gifts of precious perfumes, of cassia, of sweet woods, of coal, of cypress, an abundance of incense, of ivory tusks, of baboons, of apes, and all kinds of precious things. I embarked all in the ship which was come, and bowing myself I prayed God for him. Then he said to me, Behold, thou shalt come to thy country in two months, thou shalt press to thy bosom thy children, and thou shalt rest in thy tomb. After this I went down to the shore and to the ship, and I called to the sailors who were there. Then on the shore I rendered adoration to the master of this isle and to those who dwelt therein. When we shall come in our return to the house of Pharaoh in the second month, according to all that the serpent has said, we shall approach unto the palace, and I shall go in before Pharaoh. I shall bring the gifts which I have brought from this isle into the country. Then he shall thank me before the fullness of the land. Grant then unto me a follower, and lead me to the courtiers of the king. Cast thy eye upon me, after that I have both seen and proved this. Hear my prayer, for it is good to listen to people. It was said unto me, Become a wise man, and thou shalt come to honour. And behold, I have become such. This is finished from its beginning unto its end, even as it was found in a writing. It is written by the scribe of cunning fingers, Amenai Amenaa, may he live in life, wealth, and health. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 15 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 15. The Magic Book, from the Ancient Egyptian, edited by W. M. Flinders Petrie. In the Egyptian mythology, Ra was the supreme ruler of mankind, Osiris was the god of good, Isis was his sister and wife, and Harpocrates, or Horus, was their son. Ta was the chief god of Memphis, the editor. We were the two children of the king Mernebta, and he loved us very much, for he had no others. And Naneferkapta was in his palace as heir over all the land. And when we were grown, the king said to the queen, I will marry Naneferkapta to the daughter of a general and Ahura to the son of another general. And the queen said, No, he is the heir. Let him marry his sister like the heir of a king. None other is fit for him. And the king said, That is not fair. They had better be married to the children of the general. And the queen said, It is you who are not dealing rightly with me. And the king answered, If I have no more than these two children, is it right that they should marry one another? I will marry Naneferkapta to the daughter of an officer, and Ahura to the son of another officer. It has often been done so in our family. And at a time when there was a great feast before the king, they came to fetch me to the feast, and I was very troubled and did not behave as I used to do. And the king said to me, Ahura, have you sent some one to me about this sorry matter, saying, let me be married to my elder brother. I said to him, Well, let me marry the son of an officer, and he marry the daughter of another officer, as it often happens so in our family. I laughed, and the king laughed, and the king told the steward of the palace, Let them take Ahura to the house of Naneferkapta tonight, and all kinds of good things with her. So they brought me as a wife to the house of Naneferkapta, and the king ordered them to give me presents of silver and gold, and things from the palace. And Naneferkapta passed a happy time with me, and received all the presents from the palace, and we loved one another. 
and when I expected a child they told the king, and he was most heartily glad, and he sent me many things, and a present of the best silver and gold and linen. And when the time came I bore this little child that is before you. And they gave him the name of Marab, and registered him in the book of the house of life. And when my brother Nanifer Kapta went to the cemetery of Memphis, he did nothing on earth but read the writings that are in the catacombs of the kings and on the tablets of the house of life, and the inscriptions that are seen on the monuments. And he worked hard on the writings. And there was a priest there called Nesipta. And as Nanifer Kapta went into a temple to pray, it happened that he went behind this priest and was reading the inscriptions that were on the chapels of the gods. And the priest mocked him and laughed. So Nanifer Kapta said to him, Why are you laughing at me? And he replied, I was not laughing at you, or if I happened to do so it was at your reading writings that are worthless. If you wish so much to read writings, come to me, and I will bring you to the place where the book is, that Toth himself wrote with his own hand, and which will bring you to the gods. When you read but two pages in this you will enchant the heaven, the earth, the abyss, the mountains, and the sea. You shall know what the birds of the sky and the crawling things are saying. You shall see the fishes of the deep, for a divine power is there to bring them up out of the depth. And when you read the second page, if you are in the world of ghosts, you will become again in the shape you were in on earth. You will see the sun shining in the sky with all the gods and the full moon. And Nanaferkopta said, By the life of the king, tell me of anything you want done, and I'll do it for you, if you will only send me where this book is. And the priest answered Nanaferkopta, If you want to go to the place where the book is, you must give me a hundred pieces of silver for my funeral, and provide that they shall bury me as a rich priest. So Nanaferkopta called his lad, and told him to give the priest a hundred pieces of silver, and he made them do as he wished, even everything that he asked for. Then the priest said to Nanaferkopta, This book is in the middle of the river at Coptus, in an iron box. In the iron box is a bronze box, and in the bronze box is a sycamore box. In the sycamore box is an ivory and ebony box. In the ivory and ebony box is a silver box. In the silver box is a golden box, and in that is the book. It is twisted all round with snakes and scorpions, and all the other crawling things around the box in which the book is, and there is a deathless snake by the box. And when the priest told Nanaferkopta he did not know where on earth he was, he was so much delighted. And when he came from the temple he told me all that had happened to him. And he said, I shall go to Coptos, for I must fetch this book. I will not stay any longer in the north. And I said, Let me dissuade you, for you prepare sorrow, and you will bring me into trouble in the Thebad. And I laid my hand on Nanaferkopta to keep him from going to Coptos, but he would not listen to me. And he went to the king and told the king all that the priest had said. The king asked him, What is it that you want? And he replied, Let them give me the royal boat with its belongings, for I will go to the south with Ahura and her little boy Marab, and fetch this book without delay. So they gave him the royal boat with its belongings, and we went with him to the haven, and sailed from there up to Coptus. Then the priests of Isis of Coptus, and the high priest of Isis, came down to us without waiting, to meet Nanaferkopta, and their wives also came to me. We went into the temple of Isis and Harpocrates, and Nanaferkopta brought an ox, a goose, and some wine, and made a burnt offering and a drink offering before Isis of Koptos and Harpocrates. They brought us to a very fine house with all good things, and Nanaferkopta spent four days there and feasted with the priests of Isis of Koptos, and the wives of the priests of Isis also made holiday with me. And the morning of the fifth day came, and Nanaferkopta called a priest to him and made a magic cabin that was full of men and tackle. He put the spell upon it, and put life into it, and gave them breath, and sank it into the water. He filled the royal boat with sand, and took leave of me, and sailed from the haven. And I sat by the river at Koptos, that I might see what would become of him. And he said, Workman, work for me even at the place where the book is. 
and they toiled by night and by day. And when they had reached it in three days, he threw the sand out and made a shoal in the river. And then he found on it entwined serpents and scorpions and all kinds of crawling things around the box in which the book was. And by it he found a deathless snake around the box. And he laid the spell upon the entwined serpents and scorpions and all kinds of crawling things which were around the box, that they would not come out. And he went to the deathless snake and fought with him and killed him, but he came to life again and took a new form. He then fought again with him a second time, but he came to life again and took a third form. He then cut him in two parts and put sand between the parts that he should not appear again. Nanefercopta then went to the place where he found the box. He uncovered a box of iron and opened it. He found then a box of bronze and opened that. Then he found a box of sycamore wood and opened that. Again he found a box of ivory and ebony, and opened that. Yet he found a box of silver, and opened that. And then he found a box of gold. He opened that, and found the book in it. He took the book from the golden box, and read a page of spells from it. He enchanted the heaven and the earth, the abyss, the mountains, and the sea. He knew what the birds of the sky, the fish of the deep, and the beasts of the hills all said. He read another page of the spells, and saw the sun shining in the sky with all the gods, the full moon, and the stars in their shapes. He saw the fishes of the deep, for a divine power was present that brought them up from the water. He then read the spell upon the workmen that he had made, and taken from the haven, and said to them, Work for me back to the place from which I came. And they toiled night and day, and so he came back to the place where I sat by the river of Koptos. I had not drunk or eaten anything, and had done nothing on earth, but sat like one who was gone to the grave. I then told Nanefercopta that I wished to see this book for which we had taken so much trouble. He gave the book into my hands, and when I read a page of the spells in it, I also enchanted heaven and earth, the abyss, the mountains, and the sea. I also knew what the birds of the sky, the fishes of the deep, and the beasts of the hills all said. I read another page of the spells, and I saw the sun shining in the sky with all the gods, the full moon, and the stars in their shapes. I saw the fishes of the deep, for a divine power was present that brought them up from the water. As I could not write, I asked Nanefercopta, who was a good writer and a very learned one. He called for a new piece of papyrus, and wrote on it all that was in the book before him. He dipped it in beer and washed it off in the liquid for he knew that if it were washed off and he drank it, he would know all that there was in the writing. We went back to Koptos the same day, and made a feast before Isis of Koptos and Harpocrates. We then went to the haven and sailed and went northward of Koptos. And as we went on, Toth discovered all that Nanefercopta had done with the book. And Toth hastened to tell Ra and said, Now, know that my book and my revelation are with Nanefercopta, son of the king Mernebta. He has forced himself into my place and robbed it, and seized my box with the writings and killed my guards who protected it. And Ra replied to him, He is before you. Take him and all his kin. He sent a power from heaven with the command, Do not let Nanefercopta return safe to Memphis with all his kin. And after this hour the little boy Merab, going out from the awning of the royal boat, fell into the river. He called on Ra, and everybody who was on the bank raised a cry. Nanefercopta went out of the captain and read the spell over him. He brought the body up, because a divine power brought him to the surface. He read another spell over him, and made him tell of all that happened to him, and of what Toth had said before Ra. We turned back with him to Koptos. We brought him to the good house. We fetched the people to him, and made one embalm him and we buried him in his coffin in the cemetery of Koptos like a great and noble person. And Nanefercopta, my brother, said, Let us go down. Let us not delay, for the king has not yet heard of what has happened to him, and his heart will be sad about it. So we went to the haven. We sailed and did not stay to the north of Koptos. When we were come to the place where the little boy Merab had fallen into the water, I went out from the awning of the royal boat, and I fell into the river. They called Nanefercopta, and he came out from the cabin of the royal boat. He read a spell over me, and brought my body up, because a divine power brought me to the surface. 
He drew me out and read the spell over me, and made me tell him of all that had happened to me, and of what Toth had said before Ra. He then turned back with me to Koptos. He brought me to the good house. He fetched the people to me, and made one embalm me as great and noble people are buried, and laid me in the tomb where Merab, my young child, was. He turned to the haven and sailed down and delayed not in the north of Koptos. When he was come to the place where we fell in the river, he said to his heart, Shall I not better turn back again to Koptos, that I may lie by them? For if not, when I go down to Memphis and the king asks after his children, what shall I say to him? Can I tell him I have taken your children to the Tebaid and killed them, while I remained alive, and I have come to Memphis still alive? Then he made them bring him a linen cloth of striped byssus. He made a band, and bound the book firmly, and tied it upon him. Naniferkopta then went out of the awning of the royal boat and fell into the river. He cried on Ra, and all those who were on the bank made an outcry, saying, Great woe! Sad woe! Is he lost, that good scribe and able man that has no equal? The royal boat went on without any one on earth knowing where Naniferkopta was. It went on to Memphis, and they told all this to the king. Then the king went down to the royal boat in mourning, and all the soldiers and high priests and priests of Ptah were in mourning, and all the officials and courtiers. And when he saw Naniferkopta, who was in the inner cabin of the royal boat, from his rank of high scribe, he lifted him up. And they saw the book by him, and the king said, Let one hide this book that is with him. And the officers of the king, the priests of Ptah and the high priests of Ptah, said to the king, Our lord, May the king live as long as the sun. Naniferkopta was a good scribe and a very skilful man. And the king had him laid in his good house to the sixteenth day, and then had him wrapped to the thirty-fifth day, and laid him out to the seventieth day, and then had him put in his grave in his resting place. I have now told you the sorrow which has come upon us because of this book. End of section 15 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould Section 16 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org Egypt, Part 3 Pyramids and Palaces Historical Note With the Fourth Dynasty began the age of pyramid building. One theory of this is that each ruler at the beginning of his reign commenced a small pyramid, adding successive layers to it as the years passed, so that the size of a pyramid indicates the length of a king's reign. When the Twelfth Dynasty began, Thebes instead of Memphis had become the capital. Great advancement in architecture had been made, and literature was flourishing. This brilliant period was followed by the coming of a barbarous race from the east, known as the Hyksos. They conquered first Syria and then Egypt, and reigned for perhaps four or five centuries. Their rule is known as that of the shepherd kings. They were finally driven out by Amasis, an energetic warrior who afterwards reigned as the first sovereign of the 18th dynasty. He pursued the Hyksos into Palestine and overcame both that country and also Phoenicia. The most famous member of this dynasty, however, was Thotmes III. He extended the boundaries of his kingdom to the Tigris and the Euphrates. He was builder as well as conqueror, and to him may be ascribed the rearing of most of the wonderful temple of Karnak at Thebes. His many conquests gave him magnificent booty, which he brought home for the enrichment of his land. One of the obelisks which he built now stands in London, another is in New York. End of section 16 Section 17 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tepin. Section 17. A Trip to the Pyramids by Bayard Taylor. Yesterday I decided that the weather had finally settled fair and we might venture as far as the pyramids without encountering either rain or cold wind. Yet it was a day which would have deceived anyone unfamiliar with the phenomena of the Egyptian climate. 
the sky was overcast rather with a soft ashen colored fleecy vapor than with clouds the wind blew lightly from the south leaving a heavy sultry feeling when it paused and i was hardly a surprised when an english tourist predicted a fearful storm presently when i answered a storm is impossible today he looked at me with an air of pitying incredulity and then turned away we engaged an open carriage at twenty francs for the day provided ourselves with lunch and set out at nine o'clock just above bullock the nile is now spanned by a splendid iron bridge beyond which a broad highway has been built leading to the very base of the great pyramid this is certainly better than the former approach by ferry boat and donkey path for it reduces the practical distance from three to four hours to one and a half the way was crowded with camels and country people the former bearing huge but not very heavy burdens of freshly cut clover women and donkeys bore loads of vegetables and the boys trotted yelling after them our dark footman in his white cap and shirt ran in advance of the carriage parting the multitude to right and left with his long stick and crying out take care there take care of your legs the strangers are coming thus we passed over the bridge entered the avenue of acacias leading to gisi and saw the pyramids flushed with a faint rose color against the sky the west bank of the nile Gesseri, was formerly an island and its name indicates and will soon be one again the shallow channel having been allowed to fill up or being purposely dammed the river became so much stronger in its current that the bullock shore is partially eaten away and the island must needs be restored we presently reached the track of the railway to upper egypt which now starts from Mbabe on the western bank but will soon be run in connection with an early train from alexandria so that travellers can leave the mediterranean in the morning and almost reach siut the capital of upper egypt in the evening looking southward over the wheat fields the immense fronts of two unfinished palaces meet the eye i should take each of them to be as large as buckingham palace in london the khedive is building them for his two sons and taxes are high in egypt and money is scarce and half of mariette's inestimable collection of antiquities is stowed away in dark magazines for want of room to show them the carriage road is raised about twelve feet above the level of the soil in order to be dry during the season of inundation the acacias with which it is planted seem to grow with difficulty and just now many of them are being removed and replaced with trunks a foot or two in diameter they need expensive watering however until the roots are long enough to reach the permanent moisture of the lower soil even the huge old trees on the way to shobra seem to require an occasional drink in dry seasons nothing could be lovelier than the intensely green wheatlands stretching away to the libyan desert bounded on the south by thick fringes of palm the wind blowing over them came to us sweet with the odor of white clover blossoms larks sang in the air snowy ibises stood pensively on the edges of sparkling pools and here and there a boy sang some shrill monotonous arab song in the east the citadel mosque stretched its two minarets like taper fingers averting the evil eye and in front of us the pyramids seemed to mock all the later power of the world not forty but sixty centuries looked down upon us from those changeless peaks they antedate all other human records except those of the dynasty immediately preceding that which built them hebrew sanskrit and chinese annals seem half modern when one stands at the foot of piles which were almost as old as the Colosseum is now when abraham was born we crossed the track of the railway drove beside it for a mile or two further 
and then struck directly across the level lands toward the rocky terrace of the Libyan desert, which serves as a base for the pyramids. Children ran beside the carriage, clamoring for money, and one or two boys, laboring under the singular delusion that they were contributing to our pleasure, played the reed flute after a most weary and distressing fashion. But there was less annoyance from these causes than you generally meet in Italy or even some parts of Switzerland. Nearer the desert, there were belts of drifted sand across the road, and the wheat and clover, after struggling briefly with the ancient enemy, ceased on either side. It was so difficult for the horses to climb the last slope that we dismounted and walked to the northern base of the great pyramid, on the top of which a little flag was fluttering, and two or three dark forms were perceptible. The modern house, built by the Khedive for the reception of his royal and imperial guests, offers to all visitors the advantage of shade and cold steps to sit on. A crowd of fellas was in attendance, eager to help us up and down, to climb both pyramids in ten minutes, or to sell us modern scarabee. They are now, however, a much better behaved race than formerly. Nearly all of them have a fair smattering of English. Their demands are regulated by custom, and if the traveller chooses one as an inevitable guide and protector, he escapes much annoyance from the others. I had no desire to make the ascent a second time, although it was well worth doing once. A crawl into the hot and stifling interior can only be recommended to the archaeologist. The grand, simple masses, built by Cheops and Zephrenes, satisfy both the eye and the imagination, when viewed from below, a few hundred yards from the bases. The best point, I think, is a sandy mound beyond the things, whence you get the exact view given in one of Karl Werner's wonderful aquarels. I found this Sphinx buried under ten or fifteen feet more of sand than when I saw him last. The face was evidently intended to be seen from below, for its expression becomes almost grotesque when the spectator is brought so near its level. About eight years ago, Monsieur Mariette discovered a very ancient temple just beyond it. And this, all for lying wholly below the surface of the desert, has been kept tolerably clear of the drifting sand. I have seen nothing in Egypt which seems so old as this temple. It is built mainly of forest colored granite. The pillars simply square monoliths, roofs and doorways of the same, and no sign of inscriptions or decorative sculptures. It is certainly older and who shall say how much older than the pyramids. In some sepulchral chambers lying back of the pillared curd, the roof is made of huge blocks of alabaster. The whole edifice, in its bare and massive simplicity, suggests Stonehenge rather than the later architecture of Egypt. A small fee opened for us one of the lower rooms of the Khedive's house, and we lunched in coolness and quiet. One of the native hangers-on, after looking at me for some time, said, You were here a long while ago? Yes, I answered. Twenty years or more? Yes. And there was a gentleman with you? A name Zoe? German, I think. Yes. And you had trouble with the man who went up the pyramid? You went to yonder village, pointing towards it, called the sheikh and had the man punished? Yes. And there was a boy who carried a water bottle and the sheikh of the village told him to bring coffee for you. And there was no coffee at first, and the sheikh gave the boy a slap, threw him out the door, and told him not to come again until he brought it. Yes. Well, I was that boy. I questioned Ahmed to know whether he had told the story of my first visit with its serio-comic interlude, 
but he had not. The man's astonishing memory, after so many years of tourists, had recognized me and reproduced the incident with all its minor details. By this time, several other carriages had arrived from Cairo. Parties were launching on the cold steps, bargaining for modern scarabees, strolling towards the Sphinx with a crowd of Arabs at their heels, or climbing the steps of the Great Pyramid with many an awkward straddle, shoved from below and pulled up from above. There were tweed coats, eyeglasses, canes, chignons, fans, parasols, but let not the romantic reader suppose that the sublime repose of the old Egyptian world was in the least prejudiced by these objects. They were but as driftwood or seaweed searching around the base of mightier natural pyramids along the shores of Norway or Maine. One is carried so far back, set in the presence of such imperious human will and unhindered power that the real and far more permanent greatness of our age fades away and its careless representatives become for the time mere stingless insects than hum and buzz for a few minutes to be carried away by the next breeze. No! You might pack billiard rooms, lager beer saloons, café chatons, stockbrokers' offices and free trade league around the pyramids hold political meetings with a speaker standing on the sphinx head or make the aditum of the old temple below resound with revival hymns and you could not diminish the impression which these wonderful monuments exact and compel you to feel a deaf faith a lost race a forgotten power a half discovered history Names and glories and supreme human forces become as shadows. Yet what tremendous, overwhelming records they have left behind. As I rested in the shade, looking up to the grey pinnacles, so foreshortened by nearness that much of the actual height was lost, yet still indescribably huge, I could think of but one thing. We must have a new chronology of man. There before me, the Asher Mosaic reckoning was not only antedated, but a previous growth of long, uncertain duration was made evident. There, in stones scattered about the desert, were inscriptions cut long before any tradition of Hebrew, Sanskrit, Phoenician or Greek. Clear, intelligible words, almost as legible to modern scholarship as those of living languages. This one long, unbroken stream of light into the remote past illuminates darker historic apparitions on all sides and sweeps us, with or without a will, to a new and wonderful backward starting point. Of course, the learned in all countries are familiar with our recently acquired knowledge on this point. But is it not time to make it the property of the people everywhere, to discard the unmanly fear that one form of truth can ever harm any other form, to reveal anew, through the grandeur of man's slow development, the unspeakable grandeur of the divine soul by which it is directed, I would not venture to say that even the English tourist who addressed me with Is there uh, anything particular to see here? was not touched somewhere in the roots of his externally indifferent nature. I am quite sure that cold chicken was not the only thought of the young ladies who sat lunching on the steps. When I find a gay young Irishman to whom snipe and wild ducks are prime interest, Nevertheless, going out to see the pyramids by moonlight and then again at two o'clock in the morning to climb them for the sunrise, I am convinced that Cheops built it better than he knew, and that this pile of stones means much more to the world than the depository of his royal carcass. Well, I meant to send you practical, realistic reports of Egypt, and this letter will be sure to bring down upon me the wrath of Mark Twain and all others who distrust earnest impressions. I pled guilty, however, 
and confess that I do not wholly belong to the generation which makes jokes of accidents and murders and finds material for laughter in classic art. End of section 17. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Monica MC.